Osteobites is a weekly osteosarcoma webinar and podcast presented by MIB Agents. This week, we're talking with Dr. Jason Eustein of Texas Children's Hospital and Associate Professor, Department of Pediatrics, Baylor College of Medicine. Our panelists are OsteoWarrior and MIB Agent Junior Board Member, Maeve Smart, and OsteoWarrior and MIB Junior Board Member, Ryan Kennington, and Amanda Levine. Osteo Warrior and beloved patient advocate. I'm your host, Ann Graham. Welcome to Osteobites, everybody. My bite today is chocolate covered coconut, delicious. Uh, bonus, I won't be crunching in your ear, nice and soft. It's an exciting day today to welcome Dr. Jason Eustein. He is a two time factor speaker, a physician scientist at Texas Children's Hospital and Associate Professor, Department of Pediatrics at Baylor College of Medicine. Dr. Houston will be sharing his work on modeling and targeting MIC-driven osteosarcoma. A great panel is part of the deal today, including OsteoWarrior and MIB agent, junior board member, Maeve Smart, and OsteoWarrior and MIB junior board member, Ryan Kennington. Both Maeve and Ryan are pursuing a career in medicine. Amanda Levine, is also an osteo warrior and beloved patient advocate who's joining us as usual. And I'm Ann Graham, your host and osteo warrior and MIB agent um, president. MIB agents makes it better, MIB for kids with osteosarcoma. We help kids and families facing this aggressive cancer by providing education, direct patient and family support educational programs for uh, both patient families and physicians. If you're on this webinar, you know that osteosarcoma is the oldest known cancer with some of the oldest known treatments. So we also support the researcher and physician community with an annual conference through Osteobytes and by funding meaningful specific osteosarcoma research. A mission of this size desires the hearts and hands and minds of many we welcome your participation to make it better. Dr. Eustein, would you get us started by introducing yourself, please? Sure, thanks, Anne. Appreciate this opportunity, and thank you to MIB again for this uh, wonderful chance to discuss and present a little bit of our work. Uh, so, as Anne said, I'm a associate professor at Texas Children's Cancer Center and Baylor College of Medicine down here in Houston, Texas, and I hope everyone is doing safe and sound wherever they are. Uh, Houston is hopefully cooling off a little bit, but it's still an active area of unfortunately the COVID situation. Um, I've been down here for about 12 years at, in, at Texas Children's. I did my resident, pediatric residency and fellowship up in Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. I've had a really great time down here and um, it's been a fantastic atmosphere uh, for sarcoma research down here, but also interacting with you know, so many people across the country. Hello, my name is Maeve. I'm a two-time osteosarcoma survivor and I was diagnosed in 2011 and 2014. I'm now six years no evidence of disease and a student at Northeastern University in Boston. As Anne mentioned, I'm also a member of the MIB Agents Junior Board, and I'm excited to be here today. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ryan. Uh, I was diagnosed in 2014 when I was 17 years old with osteosarcoma. It was located in my uh, head of my right femur. I had a limb cell imaging surgery to remove that. Um, I had a relapse in 2016 and had bats to get that removed and I've been uh, no evidence of disease ever since then. Now it's at 15 and 1987, it was just 33 years since my diagnosis. I am the mother of two healthy children, thank God. And since then, I've had breast cancer in 2010 and ALS in 2018, which is why I speak funny. I'm also um, the administrator of the Facebook group, one of them, and a big contributor to another for osteogenic families. Well, again, thank everyone uh, for the opportunity to tell you a little bit about some of the research we're, we're looking into in, in terms of osteosarcoma. And one of the projects we have ongoing is uh, study, trying to model and better target what we think is uh, MIC-driven osteosarcoma. So just a brief background, you can give a little bit, a little bit of overview of MIC, uh, some of the models we've developed, uh, some of our initial characterization, hopefully some target identification. Um, 
that we think and hopefully combat some of the amplified or hyperactivation of making osteosarcoma and how we're translating some of these findings uh, towards potential preclinical models. So I've had a long-standing interest in, understand, in trying to uh, further understand the role and uh, targeting MIC-based diseases back uh, from my fellowship when I was at the Johns Hopkins. We were looking at more lymphoma models I was working on, and then I've tried to translate some of these things towards our sarcoma models uh, in osteosarcoma. So briefly, as many people know, MIC is a very potent oncogene. It's a transcription factor. Um, and it regulates potentially 15% of all the genes in, in the cell. Uh, it's ab their aberrations and potentially 70% of all human cancers in terms of uh, MIC aberrations, uh, the amplification or hyperactivation of MIC, and potentially it's a prognostic marker. And this is just showing you some of the potential cell pathways that are feeding into the regulation and activation of MIC, and we can turn on, again, a large number of genes that are involved in oncogenic processes, whether it be cell growth, proliferation, um, metastasis, and so forth. There aren't any, you know, necessarily um, uh, diagnostic point mutations in osteosarcoma. There's more common uh, copy number or uh, chromosomal operations. And with regards to copy number alterations, there's, uh, you know, high incidence of MIC amplification in osteosarcoma, and this has been characterized for a number of years now. Uh, first, I, uh, first identified, but previously identified back in the early 2000s and more elegantly as well uh, last year by Alessandro Sweet Cordero's group, again, showing amplification of a number of areas, including um, AQ24, which is where CMIC is located. So CMIC gains uh, in terms of chromosomal amplification as well as enhanced expression is associated with poor prognosis. This is using the target, you know, uh, osteosarcoma target database, uh, where we basically look at amplified versus non-amplified patients. And again, amplified patients have much poorer prognosis non-amplified in terms of chromosome or copy number alterations. And if you look at the transcript levels, high MIC transcript uh, expression versus low, again, not surprisingly high uh, expression of MIC associated with a worse prognosis. And MIC's not only, again, uh, in terms of, uh, in part, but maybe do its association with metastasis. So MIC is also increased, it's increased expression in patients with metastasis. So this is looking at primary tumors in the patients and if they had higher MIC, those were often associated with increased chance of metastasis. And that's what's showing here like, based on the transcript level, as this was also noted recently on the protein level, where patients with higher MIC protein expression were associated with higher incidence of metastasis. So MIC can regulate potentially a number of different pathways, both intrinsic and what's being elucidated more recently, extrinsic. Intrinsic pathways or intrinsic gene regulations have been well, pretty well characterized over the past uh, couple of decades. MIC has a key role in regulating cell cycle genes, regulating genes that are involved in metabolism, DNA repair, and protein biosynthesis, for example. Now, over the past several years, the role of these oncogenes, and not just MIC, but even oncogenes such as RAS and so forth, have been uh, um, investigated for their role and potentially its influence on the tumor microenvironment. And so what are the tumor cell extrinsic uh, influences that these oncogenes have? So a lot of these oncogenes can lead to tumor immune suppression, as well as obviously alterations potentially in things such as angiogenesis. But, um, you know, with regards to immune suppression, it can upregulate some of the checkpoint genes, as well as factors that potentially lead to influencing on the uh, tumor immune microenvironmental integration or um, invasion. So we've, we've developed an additional mouse model of osteosarcoma a number of years ago. And our reason for this is that we wanted to get some better insights and some better modeling of mechanisms that we can further explore. So we basically uh, used a conditional um, model where we altered uh, the osteoblast cells using a tall 2.3 pre and deleted uh, p53, either wild um, heterozygous or homozygous deletion of p53, and we're able to drive a number of osteosarcomas and potentially even metastatic osteosarcoma. Interestingly, when we analyzed some of these tumors back then, we did some um, copy number alteration analysis or chromosomal uh, hybridization. And what we saw basically is that in a number of these tumors or in a subset of these tumors, there was amplification of 15D1, which in mouse is syntenic to AQ24. So this is the region that uh, has seen MIC as well. So interesting, even though we only altered P53 in the osteoblast precursor cell, or the bone precursor cells, the osteoblasts, we were able to generate tumors that not only had obviously loss of P53, but amplification of CMIC, just like obviously the human disease as well. 
And when we looked at the MIC expression in these amplified versus some of the non-amplified tumors, again, the amplified chromosomal amplification tumors had a significantly higher expression shown here in red versus the ones that didn't have um, MIC amplification. So we want to further kind of accelerate this model, meaning that can we just kind of focus on a model that's hyperactivation of MIC? And so what we did here is cross our uh, older model with the P53 with a knock-in model of, of CMIC. Okay. So basically here, we're again, using P53, and if we only do P53, these, these mice will develop tumors over a longer latency. But if we just knock in P53, uh, um, make on top of the P53 alterations, we can obviously accelerate uh, osteosarcoma development. You can see here by Western blot, these MIC knock in mice at a significantly higher protein expression of MIC compared to the non uh, MIC knock in models. And a lot of these mice, besides developing rapid tumors, also develop metastasis. More than 60 to 70% of these mice had evidence of metastatic disease at time of sacrifice. So I'm just showing here H&E of the primary tumor of a mouse, as well as the lung lesions here. And again, different mouse samples. We did some, we've obviously been able to isolate a number of these tumors, including the lung lesions. Uh, we've been able to do some molecular profiling from these tumors. This is just showing you that we, there's evidence potentially even of enhanced MIC expression in the distal metastatic site compared to the primary site. Um, but we're also able to further derive cell lines from these models. So we were able to derive primary lines as well as potentially long lines and put them back into wild type C57 black 6, so back into immunocompetent models, which allows us to potentially not only look at intrinsic factors, but get, get, hopefully get a better, better understanding of some of the mechanistic extrinsic factors that are involved in osteosarcoma development progression with regards to um, biology. So again, one of our, our goals has been to kind of, can we kind of use our model resources, both mouse models we've generated over the years, but also the human uh, resources that have become available either through our own institutional resources, such as the PDX models we've derived from patients with osteosarcoma, obviously the pathology lab, uh, pathology slides that we have available. And of course, with more molecular data becoming available, such as target data, can we potentially integrate all of these type of model systems to get better insights into this high-risk disease state, this MIC-dependent or MIC-hyperactivated osteosarcoma subset of patients that not only can identify intrinsic, but potentially even extrinsic vulnerabilities. So with that said, I'm not going to go through all the analysis, obviously, in this period of time, but we've taken on more of a proteotranscriptomic approach, meaning that we've done transcriptomics as well as proteomics from a large number of our gem-based models, both MIC hyperactivated as well as non-MIC activated tumors. We've then fed them through a pipeline, an informatics pipeline, where we've been able to look at some of the pathway alterations, um, which, gene, which sets are enriched, which sets are downregulated. In addition, other algorithms are out there that can potentially give us insights based upon some of the gene signatures, uh, insights into uh, therapeutic um, modalities that could be applied to target these potential signatures. And finally, again, integrating all the mouse uh, uh, models and informatics we have along with our human databases as well as PDXs that uh, we've analyzed. And again, we've had a nice pipe, a nice team of members in informatics uh, that we've been able to accumulate here at BC uh, at uh, Texas Children's and they've done a lot of great work for us in terms of potentially identifying, you know, some of these pathways that we think Mick may be really uh, driving in osteosarcoma and potentially as vulnerabilities for the diseases. Now I'm just going to highlight one of the pathways in, in this short period of time. Um, this is all, again, unpublished work. I'll let you guys know that for right, uh, right now. But what we've seen is that, and one of the interesting pathways is simulation. So we see enhanced simulation of molecular signature and mic driven osteostrophoma. And up note, you know, a number of years ago, about eight years ago, this paper's from 2012, um, it was noted that mic driven tumors really potentially depend on a simulation-dependent transcriptional um, uh, program. And so that caught our interest as well, is that when we saw the simulation molecular signature, we saw this paper as well. And actually, this paper came from a colleague here at Baylor, um, Trey Westbrook. But then what is simulation? Well, it's an interesting pathway. Basically, it's a post-translational modification that happens to proteins. And so you get this little small sumo uh, protein that goes through these steps, including this SAE1 and SAE2 complex, which is basically stands for sumo-activating enzyme, either subunit 1 or subunit 2. And it goes through this cascade of uh, enzymatic events where it eventually leads to simulation of proteins. Translational modifications of proteins could alter protein stability, 
lead to changes in protein interactions, as well as even you know, drive certain oncogenic activity. And so what I show you down here is this is from an, a human osteosarcoma data set, further kind of corroborating the potential linkage between MYC expression and simulation. And this is the expression of SAE1, which again is the simulating activating enzyme 1, and MYC. So as you increase MYC expression, you're increasing SAE1 expression. It's a very high correlation there. Now what's interesting is that this pathway, the simulation pathway, uh, has become a target uh, for intervention. So Takeda Pharmaceuticals has a small molecule known as TAK981, which is an inhibitor of simulation with potential antithelioplastic activity, and it's presently in clinical trials right now. So we've formed a collaboration with Takeda, uh, no financial support, just the drug itself, uh, and we've tested uh, simulation inhibitor TAK981 on, our, uh, on some of our osteosarcoma models. And so basically, here's the TAK91. We've just uh, done a cytotoxicity assay that's you know, looking at 72 hours. And we've kind of had both hyperactive MYC as well as low MYC kind of states. Here's our mirroring model, and here's some human cell lines that we've tested, and we're still obviously going to be testing more of the cell lines and models. What you can see here is that in the low MYC states, uh, in three mouse lines as well as HOS, which we know is, has a balance of chromosome 8 and low, relatively low MYC expression, with regards to human osteosarcoma cell lines, we see relatively high, you know, 500 to over one micromolar uh, IC50s. But in the hyperactivated uh, mixed states, whether it be the F408 or M9, which are some of our mouse models we arrive, or MG63, which we know is a well, you know, well-established human osteosarcoma cell line that does have um, AQ24 or MYC amplification. And you can see here these particular cell lines have much lower um, IC50s. Um, compared to obviously the low mix states. So that's obviously targeting some of the potentially efficacy intrinsically uh, in terms of the tumors. But then we wanted to potentially use these models as well for looking at the extrinsic. So what is some of the external influence? So we wanted to see, well, how is mix affecting the tumor microenvironment? And one of the things we wanted to potentially look at, as I mentioned before, as over the past few years, is that as these oncogenes not only have the intrinsic roles, but what is their influence on the immune microenvironment, such as alterations of macrophages or NK cells and so forth. So one, of the, one of the initial experiments we've done is like, well, what is the potential effect of MYC in, ter in terms of the biology of the tumor microenvironment, specifically the macrophages? So in one experiment we've done is that we've taken media uh, or the supernatant from uh, high MYC osteosarcoma cells or the supernatant media from the low MYC osteosarcoma cells and put them on these murine um, macrophage line known as a raw 264 cells. So these are monocytes that can bench potentially be differentiated along towards M1 macrophages, which are more the quote unquote good macrophages and potentially have anti-tumor effects, or differentiated towards the M2 macrophage state, which again is more associated with the bad macrophages and more um, pro-tumor effects. So basically we wanted to see, well, what is the effects of potentially the signaling or, or the interactions between high mirroring osteocircle cells and low mirroring osteocircle? Cells. And so what we see here is that when we took the supernatant from the low mix cells, we really didn't change much in terms of markers for M2. So we're using arginase here, and we can use other markers for M2 as well, but I'm just showing you one here. We're checking by qPCR the expression level changes of this particular marker. And with the taking the media from the low mix and putting them on the raw, we really don't differentiate them along the M2 line. However, when we take the media from the high mix state, we get a significant increase in the arginase within the raw cells, indicating that potentially they're differentiating along this M2 line. So with that potential, and we have other cell lines we've tested seeing other uh, similar effects and we're using other markers of M2 as well and M1. But then we want to see, well, can we potentially reverse that polarization or that, um, or that effects of the MIC-driven model? So we basically, can we target the simulation and reverse the M2 polarization? So we set up the same type of model I just showed you before where we were potentially taking the supernatant from the low mix cells or supernatant from the high mix cells, but before doing that, we added the TAK981. So again, the stimulation inhibitor, and then did the same type of experiment. And what you can see here is the fact that um, basically uh, in the low mix cells, which are the F325 cells, again, we don't get much change into the M2 or M1, and the TAK981 at even just 10 nanomolar has a little effect on has some you know, decrease in the M2, but the M1 to M2 ratio goes up a little bit to 2.7, which is interesting, again, taking the media from the high mix state 
alone. Again, so this is just a supernate from there. We get, again, high induction of the M2 marker. Okay. But when we take the media that's been pre-treated with the TAK981, again, we re reverse that effect of the media from the high mixed state, and you get a significant decrease in the M2 marker uh, down from 4.6 to down to 0.18, and we reverse the M2 to M1 uh, ratio, so a much higher M1 to M2 ratio when we add in the, the simulation inhibitor. So again, this is all preliminary data. We're now, obviously this is all in vitro as well, we're now moving this these type of studies to in vivo, uh, seeing we're going to be able to assess not only, you know, effects on the actual tumor itself, the tumor microenvironment, and also we can take blood from these animals and assess for any kind of uh, immune response, if you, you know, cytokine changes and so forth. So this is, again, one of the new mechanisms that we're further exploring to potentially target this mixture of an osteosarcoma. So just kind of summarize, again, the short talk, um, you know, we've kind of developed and characterized some of these mixture of an osteosarcoma models. We have some uh, Next, what we're actually doing is all the data I've shown you is both predominantly from the primary tumor site. We're now actually looking, obviously, at the metastatic signatures, seeing how MIC-driven metastatic signatures could be different from its primary signature and the effect of it on the microenvironment there as well. We've done some preliminary cross-species analysis, as I showed you. I've identified potential intrinsic and extrinsic vulnerabilities. Again, showing you one example of the simulation. We've tested it preclinically in vitro, and now we're obviously moving towards in vivo. And down the road, we're also going to be using it on uh, make amplified PDXs, which again, some of the resources we've garnered over the past couple of years, as well as some of our other mirroring models, combination therapies, including things such as chemotherapy, and other intrinsic targeting agents, as well as intrinsic and potentially tumor modulating uh, factors. So with that said, of course, a lot of this work couldn't be done without the great uh, support and efforts of my team. Um, wonder, I'm really lucky to have a wonderful group of lab members Everybody from basic science, you know, postdocs to, to you know, clinical fellows uh, that, and, and junior faculty that work in the lab. So with that, uh, I will take any questions. Thank you so much. Um, we have one question that is, can you please explain what it means to you as a researcher and clinician when a patient has mink amplification four times in the primary tumor, but then it is missing in the lung metastasized tumor? So I guess if the uh, primary tumor has the MIC, if all the cells, you're assuming all, you know, could, could there be a clone that had, did not have the MIC amplified, that is the one that's for some reason metastasized to the lung successfully. Um, and that's potentially one reason. I mean, you said it had four times, is, is that right? Or Yes. So, yeah, I mean, that's an interesting case, unfortunately, but... Um, you know, there's potentially the, you know, escape of a clone that did not have the amplification and was successful in, in colonizing the lungs. Do you believe that everyone that is newly diagnosed, do they get genomic testing? I think that's become more the norm nowadays, yes, in terms of, you know, obviously a lot of them will definitely will get the, you know, again, it depends on where the patient's located, you know, what academic center, things like that, but a lot of times there is a lot of the genomic testing going on. How do we get every doctor to say, hey, since we're in you, can we get a piece of this tumor for genetic testing? There is some of that going on, yes. There is obviously with clinical trials and some of the things like that that are going on that there is some sharing of the tumors. Yes. And what phase is that clinical trial in? The TAK one that I talked about, it's a phase one trial right now, an adult malignancy. So right now it's just in adults, um, but obviously, you know, we'll see where it goes in the future. It's unfortunately from the patient side, we hear regularly that patients are not being asked if, if genomic testing can take place on their tumor. It's many times it's patient driven. Yeah where patients are going, do I need to have this tested? And our, you know, one of our goals at MIB uh, was a project we worked on with, with Richard Gorlick and Corey Painter and uh, Katie Janeway and uh, osteosarcoma uh, mother and MIB agent family, Christina Iptoma, uh, really she championed the whole thing and put together a testing and research directory. And it's, it really, it's, it's this brilliant directory that shows where you can send your, your tumor data 
to either inform research or to infor inform a personal treatment plan. And it, it, it's comprehensive. Uh, many institutions have participated in this directory and it gives information about whether you own your tumor when, when you send it out or, or whether now it belongs to the place that you sent it. But I, I guess when it, there's an ethical question, right? If you're MIC amplified, what do you do? Is it fair to say chemo re, you're chemo resistant if you're? I don't think it's fair to say that at this stage. And obviously, I mean, there's still you know patients that respond, yeah. respond well. Um, you know, there might be other again more details that need to go into the our, even our studies in terms of looking at what other factors are collaborating or working with make amplification to further um, either be a good prognostic thing or a poor prognostic thing. Right. Yeah. Definitely more genetic testing would, I think, be of help to, to everyone. Researchers, right, patient families. Yeah. I think a lot of that's just some bit more institutional or where you are, regional, things like that. So. Right, and where you're getting your information from. Where you're getting, right. So we're, we're, as we say, beating that drum regularly, get, send your tumor out to, or request that your tumor get sent out, especially in, at initial biopsy, and then throughout, throughout the many surgeries that osteosarcoma patients go through to keep getting that tumor tested. Yeah, really key. Right. What would be like your vision of, uh, you know, what the no new norm would be for, uh, I guess, ge uh, getting genetic testing and how that would help your research and also help uh, like diagnosis and like treatment plans for osteosarcoma? I think genetic testing is, is, is important. I think as we're moving towards Integrating more of the omics is, is interesting to me, I think, as well. Obviously, I think the mutation status or the, the things like that is potentially as important, but also, um, you know, what's going on at the transcript level, what's going on at the proteomics level. Um, there's some interesting papers that have come out there for other adult cancers, such as lung cancer and things like that, that have really shown when they're integrating the proteomics side of things on top of the, some of the genetics, you know, mutations, as well as transcript alterations, they're finding these other subset of patients even just based on the proteins because it's not always, you know, the correlation between the transcript level and proteins is not always perfect, of course. So, you know, some of these protein signatures could be very interesting and informative as well uh, towards, um, you know, identifying whether it be a subset of patients or helping with side on therapeutic interventions, things like that. Uh, we have a, a question from Dr. Benevente, University of California, Irvine. Dr. Benevente. Hey, Jason. I was curious. Uh, do you yeah. know if SA1 is a direct target of MIC? That's a great question. I've, I've, we haven't tested that ourselves. Um, it's something we're looking into just in terms of osteosarcoma, but I think it's it's been reported to be associated with other MIC-driven cancers, let's just say that. I don't remember off the top of my head whether it's a direct target or not. Um, and that's something we were just gonna check real quick as well. Right, and, and, and I was curious, from the proteomic analysis that you've been doing, have you been yeah, able see, to ident yeah. identified what is driving the, the changes in marker expression that you see in the monocytes, macrophages, so that M1 to M2? We, so that's something we're working on now. We haven't, we haven't, that, I'll tell you that data I just showed you with regards to uh, the co-culture type of experiments or, you know, the media, those have been over the last two months. And so, you know, a lot of this is just pretty new data. Um, but we're some, that's what we're looking towards that as well. Yeah, so unfortunately, I don't have great molecular mechanistic insights yet. Thanks. But that's down the road. Thank you, though. We received another question that says, going back to the slide on amplifications, I noticed that besides 15D1, there was no mention of 4C1 and 12C1. What pathways do those affect if not CMIC amplifications? Yeah, we haven't specifically looked at those in the mouse model in terms of what they're syntactic to at this time. Obviously, we, you know, we were focused on, I mean, there, there's other genes of interest that we're looking at, but we haven't specifically focused on anything on, in those, on those particular chromosomes at this time. Do you have any idea what percentage of tumors you see in the lab are osteosarcoma patients are MIC amplified? Well, I think, you know, if you look at the read the data or read the other outside, people report anywhere from usually about 20 to 30 something percent will have the MIC amplification. Um, we've seen, I don't know, I think our stats are about probably fall in that range as well here at TCH. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the, the general, you know, 
general yeah. ballpark range. I mean, high enough that this is. Um, yeah, probably about 30%, give or take. Yeah, really important work. Really, really important work for, for osteosarcoma patients and families. Uh, thank you for undertaking My pleasure. It's, My pleasure. it's a difficult, this is a difficult puzzle to solve, this particular one. So it, it, it takes, it takes a, a lab like yours to, to get it, get it seen to and, um, and no stone unturned. So thank you for doing that. My pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity to kind of update people on what we've been trying to do. Oh, I always love to hear you talk. <laughs> um, so let's see. Let's, uh, if there are no other questions, we'll get, um, we'll get wrapped up here and let you know that on next week's Osteobites, we are honored and excited to have Dr. Richard Gorlick with us. He'll be talking about correlative science leading to active and emerging clinical trials. Dr. Gorlick is also a regular factor speaker and collaborator with MIB agents. We hope you'll join us then. Um, finally, the most comfortable t-shirt ever. <laughs> you can get one too, along with a cape and be like Dr. Eustine, right? Yes, I got mine right here, back here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when you outrun osteosarcoma with us, sign up on our website, MI, on our website, mibagents.org, under what we do, or email me at ann, A-N-N, at mibagents.org uh, for the link. We'd love it if you asked your friends and family to join you, sign up too, in honor of an osteo warrior. Your participation allows us to fund meaningful research, like Dr. Eustine's, which needs funding always, and uh, it also helps support our programs that uh, take care of uh, osteosarcoma patients and families. Thank you for joining us today, and of course, thank you to our guests, Dr. Jason Eustine, and our panelists, Maeve, Amanda, and Ryan. Stay safe, everyone. Wear your mask. If MIB agents can be of help to you, please let us know. Together, we make it better for osteosarcoma kids everywhere. Upcoming Osteobites are featuring osteosarcoma experts, Dr. Richard Gorlick, Dr. Kurt Weiss, and Dr. Damon Reed. We hope you'll join us. Until next Thursday, please use your powers for good for kids with osteosarcoma. Visit our website at mibagents.org.